and counseling ministry for all the churches, all the states, everywhere. It is a very common chronic problem that people have what we call unresolved grief. And very, very often they'll come in counseling and they suffer various anxiety, stress, whatever it might be, and they'll meet with me. And usually at the heart of it is some wound or woundedness they had earlier in childhood. It might have been a few years ago, but and they have grieving left to do. And I'll tell you stories that, um, as you go along of, of some examples of that. So anyway, that's a sad thing, not to be a pun, but it's a sad thing that so many people have so much grief that's not been attuned to. There's not been a validation to hurting. And so it's a real deal. It's a real problem. It's a very real problem. And then forgiveness is another issue, too, because a lot of people deal with other people. And at some point, they're going to be offended, hurt, harmed. I mean, we just are. We just are going to be harmed or hurt somehow, some way. And so um, forgiveness is a really big deal. Uh, therapists the last few decades have started to catch on and started to pay more attention to forgiveness and the power of forgiveness. The church has been saying it for a long, 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 long time. But nevertheless, uh, there's so the second major point about that is there's so much misunderstanding about forgiveness. I want to talk about it because I've heard if, if people mean well, just a normal conversation when people talk about forgiveness. And, and I was going to know that's not what the Bible means by that. And no, that's not what it means in general. And so that's not to be a know-it-all. The problem is, if you get the wrong understanding of forgiveness and how to do it, then you you feel guilty when you. I, but I still struggle with. Well, well, that's okay. But then you start, you know, it starts a heap of guiltiness, and so that's why grief and forgiveness go together because of overwhelming pastoral experience with these issues. So what I'll do is we'll go over this. Uh, you have I don't have a teacher's handout. I have one handout. This this is different than other stuff usually. So you have everything I have. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull, and that's on purpose. Because on this kind of study, which can, sometimes isn't the happiest study, sometimes it brings up grief and things you need to forgive, and that's okay. It's okay not to be happy all the time. It's also okay not to be happy in my presence. Uh, it's not okay to be mad at me, but other people you can be mad at. Oh, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. So it's okay. It is, I say this all the time because it's so true. It is okay not to be okay. It's just okay not to be okay. And so we don't think it's okay. I do, but most people don't. And I know that because I hear it all the time. As soon as someone starts crying, they go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like they've just done something wrong, immoral. They've just sinned. I'm not pointing anybody, Jennifer. I'm not pointing anybody out. I'm not going to call anybody's name out, Jennifer, or anybody. But she pointed at herself. That's why I'm doing that. But that's because of a belief that so many people have. It's a, it's a pervasive belief amongst people that being sad is a bad thing because we feel those, those people who do that, they feel like their sadness is a burden on someone else. And that's usually a shame issue. We can talk about that if you want to. That's a, that's a self-esteem issue, not a grieving issue. So I'm saying right now in my presence, I am genuinely always okay with sadness. It doesn't freak me out. It doesn't make me anxious. It doesn't make me, you know what it does? It makes me what hopefully what Christian is supposed to. It makes you feel empathetic. And a lot of people don't like empathy. No, 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 it's not your fault. I didn't say it was my fault. Well, you shouldn't have pity. Yeah, I should. I'm a Christian. Yeah, I should, actually. That's your issue, not mine. Christians are supposed to experience these things. So so it's okay to be sad. We've got tissue everywhere. You run off to a restroom, take a break when you do. And you go as deep as you want. What I'll do is I'll go along with the notes, uh, slow but surely. I'll give some reflections, unpack this, whatever questions or comments. Let's just talk. So I don't want to be talking if I can for the next 90 minutes. You know, as usual, I'm going to be able to, we can dialogue about this. Um, is that okay? Make sense? How are we doing? All right, we'll get going. Uh, this, so what is grief? What, why, and how? <laughs> we'll talk grief. So maybe a week, this week we'll get through a couple pages. Grief is our emotional response to loss and disappointment. And if you make it even shorter, you'd say it's our response to loss. Well, please let that sink in. Right now, if you're raised in an environment, I mean, right now in your mind, in your psyche, in your belief system, if you were not raised in a home where it was okay to experience loss, you have no idea what I just talked about. Because you don't have an emotional response to loss because you had to just, what, suck it up, move on, buck up, cowboy up. And so you were never taught this. Grief is a normal, healthy, legitimate, logical, if you might say it that way, God-given emotional expression to when we lose something. Some disappointment of something. The feeling we have about that loss is called grief. It might be something as minor as, oh man, Greg didn't bring me a Coke Zero. He knows how much I like Coke Zero. He didn't bring me one, so I'm grieving right now. <laughs> he knows that. And that's pretty severe. You have one? I got half of one. You got half of one? And I bet you'd give it because you're so sweet. 
St. Greg, St. Greg, maybe, maybe not. Jenny said, I don't know. Something that mild, like, oh man, uh, I beat, I was gonna get that light, the red light, green light, oh man, all the way to severe, horrible, morose grief. Grief is the word we use for any kind of emotional state that's responding to a loss, okay? So I hope the whole study of grief and forgiveness, you think about that because it's okay to reflect on loss. It's okay. It could be the loss of an expectation, a loss of a dream, a loss of a hope, a loss of a marriage, loss of a child, loss of a job, loss of a everything, a skill set, a loss of a memory you just like remembering, the loss of mobility. And so whenever we lose something, we feel it, whether we consciously acknowledge it or not, we feel it. We feel it. And most people are bad at stopping going, what just happened? Oh wait, I'm feeling something. No, 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 suck it up. No, no, I'm strong. Most of us stop. I feel sad. Well, that's just silly. No, stop. It's not that big a deal. All the junk people say to themselves that you learn from childhood, that you're not given permission to feel sad. And those are horrible false beliefs. And we'll talk about those a lot, but it is the emotional response to loss, and that is okay, and that's good. It has various features, grief does. Grieving and mourning is the process of working through the pain and sadness to get eventually to a place of acceptance. Acceptance is somewhat of a trick word or a tricky word because acceptance does not mean you like it. And a lot of people think that when they think of acceptance. They think, I don't like it at all. Acceptance doesn't mean you like it. Acceptance doesn't mean you're happy. Acceptance doesn't mean you feel joy uh, about what happened when someone died of cancer or there's a tragic death or a car wreck or a spouse walked out on you and well, I thought I'm going to accept it. No, I'm never, because I'm never going to like that. We don't have to like it. It's not about that. It's not about your emotional state of likeness. Accept means coming to some degree of emotional closure that it happened. And all the tears and poison came out of you. Enough of it. That's all that means. Just accept, yep, I accept it happened. It doesn't mean you like it. Um, and we... If you've ever grieved on something pretty minor, you know what I'm talking about. You come to, for example, not bringing Coke Zero. Man, it makes me sad, but I move on. I get over it. You might say, I accept the loss. I couldn't get the Coke Zero. And that takes me a few seconds. I'm over it. Bigger things take longer. But the point is you do, and you can't get to the place where you go, yeah. Now, when I think about it, it makes me sad. But I've come to accept, I accept, and I did. I've spent some time grieving over the loss of whatever I grieved on. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. So th that's it. Emotional response and so on. When I say, or how is your grieving coming? How is your mourning coming? I mean, how are you processing this pain and sadness? And some people work on grieving for the rest of their lives because of what was done to them. It depends on what the issue is. And that's okay. Grief language speaks of pain, loss, other negative emotions. I like how June Hunt gives these examples. These are ways of saying, these are grieving statements. And these are things counsel listen to very carefully when we ask, how are you feeling? Which most people don't know how to say those answer to that question. They say, "I feel like it's, I, I feel like it's w windy outside." They're, no, that's not a feeling. There's no feeling chart called windy outside. Then, whereas most people say feeling, they say I think. They really is what I'm thinking. Feelings are different, and so we listen to these things, even if they can't use the vocabulary. I'm grieving over. I was so embarrassed when. That's a grieving word. Uh, I felt abandoned by. I was really hurt when. I've been, de uh, been determined never to allow X happen again. These things demonstrate a degree of loss or disappointment in your grieving. I might add other things like sometimes I'm still really, really angry over. That's part of the grieving process. It really ticks me off. I'm still peed off that da, 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 da. That's part of the grieving process. And we can get stuck in these different stages of grief. I'm just going to stay mad forever. You can. But that means you're never going to go to a place to accept it. You'll stay constantly angry. Your adrenaline's going to be on and on. Your anxiety's going to be skyrocketing. It's gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna suffer. But I feel right to do it. Yeah, I know that's why you do it, but it's gonna hurt you. So grieving involves all these different places. So my encouragement at this point is, that's the what of grief. I'm gonna do a little homework for you. It, it, I'll throw a homework along the way and you do what you want. I'm not gonna quiz you on it, of course, you know. But if I were you, I would at this stage in your game, if you haven't already, if you even have, try your best to start learning how to speak about how you feel. To use the not fancy but fancy word in psychology we use all the time, particularly the last few decades, is be mindful of yourself. Be mindful of how, how am I doing? 
We are so bad at that as a human race, certainly as Americans, because we're, the American uh, value system, which is different from Asians and Mexicans, they, they, I mean, the studies demonstrate this, we're so pragmatic. How you doing? I'm busy, but I'm fine. Right? We just, we can't, we can't slow down. <laughs> you know, in France, they work 30 hours a week and they protest the snot. They do huge marches in the street because they don't want to work 30 hours a week. I've seen the documentaries, huge strikes. We're not putting in 50, 60 hours a week. What's wrong with you? That's the American mindset, so we don't have, we don't have time for that. I've asked guys before, um, how do you feel about that? Well, I, I think, well, no, no, how do you feel? It takes him, and then finally use a feeling where I'll say, do you ever feel sad? No, nope. and he said, I remember that one guy in particular, I can tell you many names. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for what? I don't have time to feel sad. That's, that's a very Americana. And you say, well, it's Midwest. It's not, it's all over the place. But everyone thinks in their culture, they're unique, but they're not. Everywhere I've been, it's all, it's all the same. So my encouragement as the homework is try to practice feeling vocabulary. Men are historically horrible at this because we're not trained to do it. We were not trained by our parents. Our parents weren't trained. Their parents weren't trained. Their parents weren't trained. Guys were told to suck it up, move on, don't be a sissy, don't be a girl. Shows weakness. I've heard it once, I've heard it a trillion times at funerals. I'm trying to stay strong for so-and-so. I gotta be strong for so-and-so. And I always say, why do you think that's a sign of strength? And there's always a long pause. Well, I just think that if I cry a lot, they're going to be sad. Mm -hmm. And what's wrong with being sad? Well, I don't want them to be sad. I understand, but what's wrong with being sad? Well, nothing, I guess. Then why are you trying to stop them from being sad? The point is, they don't know. They've been taught that all their lives. Guys and girls have been taught that. There's are. So I encourage us to think about how you talk about feelings. I know it sounds contradictory, but pause. And men particularly. And so the women in your lives can ask you, how do you feel? Not all feeler types are good at that either, but there you go. I know Dave, sorry man, got homework this week. How do you feel? I feel hungry, woman. No, I feel, we know basic things. I feel sad, I feel sleepy, I feel joyful, I feel happy. I might feel calm. Calm's a feeling, I feel calm. A lot of times kids use the word calm, instead of calm they say the word bored. No, I'm calm, I'm in a state of tranquility. Or I'm anxious, I'm stressed. And there's a whole host of things on the anger scale. There's mild annoyance to frustration, to anger, to rage. And a lot of times we'll set the stage by how we feel by using those words that ramp us up. I'm so mad. Are you really so mad or are you just mildly annoyed? Well, I, I guess I'm more annoyed. But see, when you say I'm really mad, you, you ramp yourself up to that. So Paul should love and say, I don't know, how do I feel? I don't know. I need time to think about it. Okay, then think about it. But you just get, you get better at it. You get more, more mindful. And really healthy people will tell you throughout the day, you're supposed to do mindfulness checks throughout the day. Every few hours go, how am I doing? What's going on inside of me? If you want, I can, I'll move on, but that's, I can tell you stories in my life of like, <sighs> I've been clenching my teeth for an hour. I've been panting <laughs> for two hours. I gum it. I should be breathing slowly. Why? Because I'm stressed because oh, I got the email that ticked me off or so-and-so triggered me and blah, blah, Okay. All right. I got to stop this for a second and do this, but do be mindful. And grieving is one of those things. But we don't want to go there because grieving is sad. It doesn't make us feel happy. We don't like non-happy feelings. I'm saying we have to. If you want to be healthy. If not, go ahead. But. Any question on the what? What is grief? That's what I'm talking about. Anything? Why grieve? Grieving is God's gift to us. It is our ability to process loss while we are living as disciples of Jesus in this world. It's our ability to process loss. That is fantastic. You don't have to have any education, any money, any prestige, anyone in the world, babies come out of the womb and they know how to process loss or anger or frustration. The tears come out. A lot of people say, God put ear, uh, eye, uh, tear ducts in our eyes so that other people can see our grief. You can see it. No, I don't know if that's for sure, but that's an interesting thesis. It is our, it's a gift. It's a gift that we do not avail ourselves up enough. We just don't. We find ourselves stuffing it, stuffing it, denying it, denying it. It's a gift to process. Let that, those tears come out. Remember in John eleven thirty five. 35? You know what it says in John eleven thirty five? 35? Two words. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. No, no, I ain't got time for that. Uh, they should tell Jesus that. What are you doing, sissy? Cowboy up, Jesus. I wouldn't tell that to Jesus. I think he knows a little something about something. You can look up Mark 14, 34, Luke 19, 41. If you want to, we can. But the point is, this is grieving. We can look up Romans uh, 12, all over the place. Paul says, and I'll talk about this as we go on, but 
to grieve with those who grieve, rejoice with those who rejoice. Grieving is good. 1 Thessalonians 4. I don't want you to grieve as those who have no hope, brothers, but those who do have hope because da 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 da. I want you to grieve like them. We don't have a we have a bottom. We don't have total despair. But grieving is good. It is a gift. And it's a gift we're worthy of. And anybody who's told you differently was mistaken. They were mistaken. Our body lets us know if you're not grieved enough. It's, we call this repressed grief. Our body does. Repressed grief appears in unwanted behavior and mindsets, typically unwanted. It might make you feel like fatigued or exhausted. You might feel physical pain or sensations, lack of sleep, a loss of appetite, depression. Depression, a lot of people think, in popular vocabulary, depression, people think depression is a kind of severe sadness. Maybe. Kind of. Depression is much more of a sense of feeling like you're in a fog. You almost disassociate from yourself. You, you feel listless. You feel detached from desires. Call it an apathia. Amethia, I'm trying to remember the exact Latin of the Greek word. You, you, you lose desire things you used to do. Sadness could be a component of it. Uh, but in common language, people will say, man, I didn't get that, missed that movie. I was so depressed. Like, no, you weren't. Like, you may have been sad, but depression is usually a clinical state, of that, and it's real. Uh, just like people think schizophrenic means you have different personalities. That's completely wrong, too, but I'll stop. Preaching for a second. Loss of appetite, depression, guilt, and anger. Sometimes that comes out, your body's going to come out in nightmares. Forgetfulness, like your mind just can't focus sometimes, and forgetfulness is like that. Instability, uh, or inability to concentrate, rather. Um, that's so true. Like, I can't just focus. I can't, but my mind's all over the place. Behaviors that escape in their severe form, we, we call we call that disassociation. You're it's constantly, you kind of leave it. When I'm really triggered really badly, I trick all my childhood, I disassociate a lot. But withdrawal, not one bear on people. This happens all the time with people. That I counsel. I don't want to be around anybody right now. Moody, loss of faith or anger at God, all kinds of things. And if I may introduce something here that as we talk about um, in psychology, we use this very often back to, I think Sigma Freud first introduced it, but now it's used everywhere all the time, is that we have inside of us this, this, this character. This character. In, inside of every single person, there are at least three major, we call them ego states. Ego states, ego from the Greek. It just means like a state of consciousness, a state of personality. We all have them. We all have them. And uh, there's a whole study I might do. I've done here at churches and it's seemed to be fruitful called transactional analysis. But we all have three different ego states. We have the parent ego state. We have the adult ego state. And then we have the child ego state. And then most therapists break this up in two major categories. The parent um, there's the critical parent. That's the part of you that learned that, uh, to judge behaviors, decisions. Don't do that. Don't slap your sister. Go to bed early. Brush your teeth. The, the, when you think of a commandment, imperative, that's the critical parent. And then we have a nurturing parent. I can tell within a few seconds if I meet a person, if they're one of these parents. Within a few seconds, I can tell. I can tell by what they say to me or what they say about themselves. I'm so sorry. I know I'm stupid. Oh, you have a critical parent in your mind all the time. I mean, you can tell very quickly about what people talk. The adult ego state, if you know your Star Trek nerds like myself, think of Spock or data. The adult ego state is the part of you that collects data in the moment and makes decisions. I'm cold. Put on a coat. I'm hot. Turn on the air conditioner. I'm hungry. It's time to eat. I want to set up. My back hurts. Well, that's the adult ego state. Most healthy people will say most people, most of the time, should stay in the adult ego state. The general information gathering, curious state of being. Then the child state is in two major ways. The reactive and then the adaptive. But anyway, the point is there, the reactive and the adaptive. Um, basically, think of it this way. Um, the main thing I want you to associate with I don't want to get bogged down here. It's my fault. These excursies are always something can get me off track. The child you're saying, I want you to basically think is that the child state feels. Think that. I want you to think the child state feels. I want you to think the adult think the adult state thinks. I want you to think the parent state. Um, you might say oversees or governs or. Um, I don't know what right word there governs, maybe. Um, but governs, thinks, and child feels. 
That's the main thing I want you to emphasize. That's all this is about. And my point right now is every single person who's listening to me now, every human being who is alive, has these three major ego states inside of you all the time. And what happens in tragedy is when we've gone through any kind of trauma, trauma is experienced, trauma is, ex trauma is experienced any time that a person goes through a, a situation that their brain considers to be dangerous and extreme loss, like the loss of a baby, of a child, a spouse, our brain associates that dangerous because it feels panicky, feels like we're in danger, you know, it's sometimes it feels like we are really sad, it feels panicky. Anytime we've experienced danger, and we have experienced that danger in a state of helplessness, that develops trauma. And that's, so we're a victim. We're a victim and we're in danger. That develops trauma in the brain. Children and our adult ego, in our child ego state, is linked with trauma. The adult ego state does not think of trauma. Uh, it doesn't deal with it, but they think about it, process it, but that's not the point, and parents don't at all. The child state responds to trauma. So grieving, grieving therefore, is always dealing with the child ego state. The, what happens inside of us, no extra charge for this, because this is just the way it is. I mean, our human, we work this way. When we go through any kind of sadness, a trauma or a loss of some sort, whether it happened when we were literally in the, a toddler, or if it happened this morning, if it's a serious enough trauma we go through, the wounded child is stuck in that state of sadness or trauma until the child is attended to. Until the child is attended to. And that's why in therapy, I oftentimes work with people and we need to go back when they're six years old, 12 years old, maybe they were molested, maybe they were hurt, maybe it was a car wreck, maybe it was mom and daddy got divorced, maybe it was whatever it is. And like, no, that, that was 50 years ago. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. I guarantee you've got a seven-year-old little girl inside you going, hmm. I don't want them to be divorced. Or you've got a seven-year-old little girl, six-year-old boy inside of you, if it's a man going, uh, I'm sad because they took my toy. My, my brother always hit me. And he's sitting there and he's still pouting and sad. And the reason why he's still there is because he never got attention. And so we call that the wounded child. So grieving, to say it a different way than what I've just said in the why part, why do we grieve? It is God's gift. Why do we grieve? Because we want the wounded child to heal. That's why we grieve. So you'll hear me use that vocabulary a good bit because it's second nature. Grieving is about getting attention to the wounded child, comforting the wounded child inside of us. All of us do it. Now, some of you right now don't hear me, don't believe me because you're thinking, well, I mean, I do, but I don't, but I can't go there. Or you're saying, no, I don't. I do only because I'm weird. Other people don't have this problem. And that's because you had a huge critical parent in your mind and you're, as a child that didn't give you permission to be wounded. And that was sad and ridiculous and unhealthy that you never deserve that. See, children are victims. They don't have the skill set. They're constantly helpless. I mean, even after teenage years, they're, they're helpless. They don't have the tools or the skill sets to process loss well. They don't, they're not taught, they have to be taught that. They come out of the womb knowing how to cry. They don't, they're not taught how to process the grief. That is long-term, like really traumatic stuff. Little stuff, sure, they can just cry it out. But what happens is when they get a little bit older, a mom and daddy, they have their own issues too, then they tell that child to be quiet, knock it off, be strong, and so it teaches them that wounded child is bad. So they develop what we call toxic shame. Now, I don't feel good to be mean because I do feel sad sometimes, but I can't let it be known there's going to be something wrong with me because mom says I shouldn't be so sad all the time. My dad says I should buck up. And so there must be something. There's nothing wrong with you at all. But now, now that's the belief that gets instantiated in when we're 6, 7, 8, 12 years old, 18 years old, and we have it forever. I mean, I've counseled 70 something year old people said, I've, I've thought that my entire life, and I'm so sorry you have. When they finally go back, yeah, I guess, think of it, yeah, mom and dad said that all the time. And so they have this wounded child that never grieved. Well, David, can I, what do I do now? Because I can't, I can't change the trauma. That's exactly right. You cannot change the trauma. You can change how you respond to the trauma. You can change how you respond to the trauma. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. That's the phenomenal gift of God. I can't revisit my own life and all the regrets, I, all the bad choices, junk I made in my life, all the things done to me. Oh, my goodness, if I could go back and change. All the things done to me. I can't change that. What I do now, no matter how many years go by, I can go back and revisit that event and go back to give attention to that wounded child David inside who's still sad and say, come here, baby. Look, listen, I'm going to come for you for a while. We're going to process this together. I'm going to let you cry. I'm going to let you be sad. Because I know you're there because you're making me not eat as much. You're making me 
extra irritable. You're making me very exhausted. You're giving me nightmares. The wounded child's going, yeah, I'm getting your attention. That's all that is. It's your wounded child trying to get attention. That's all it is. Doesn't mean you're stupid. Doesn't mean you're a loser. Doesn't mean you're broken. Doesn't mean you're screwed up. All the stuff people say about themselves. What does it mean? It means you're wounded. And you need to be comforted. You need to process the grief. That's it. You're wounded. Being wounded, wounded is not bad. And almost certainly you're wounded because of something done to you. That it wasn't your choice. Most of the time. Most of the time. Sometimes not. Sometimes we grieve for what we've done ourselves. And we'll talk about that. Quote, unquote, forgiving ourselves. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Yes. yes. Can any of the child's ego state be conditioned from a parent being critical? Can it, that so can the child state be conditioned by the parent? Like somebody always, you know, doing I'm sorry and all that. Like we've learned how to condition that. Does that follow in any of this? So like the parent said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry right. all the time? And then like. Correct. My grandmother did that over yeah. and over, and she right. still does it. My mom does it somewhat, and I still. Correct. Yeah. Now we call that learned behavior. That's right. right. That's exactly right. Every child's exactly right. So the answer is absolutely, stinkingly yes. Or like a kid, you tell them you're stupid. You're stupid. You're yeah. Stupid. And they tell a kid you're stupid. You're stupid. That's right. They'll go. I'm stupid. Children believe what the parents say that that that's their. I cannot express how important this is to understand because kids see parents as li the source of their survival. Right. They're the source of my food, my drink, my love, my validation, my everything. And so I, whatever it is they say or do, I have to go along or I might die. I have to accept whatever they're telling me, no matter how dumb it is or horrible it is. So yes, absolutely gets programmed into us. And those are called, we call those irrational beliefs or fault, those patterns that we learn and beliefs we learn and patterns we learn and learn behavior. And all that can be unlearned. It can be unlearned, but it has been learned. And it takes courage to say, that's where I learned that. It takes courage because most people have such a shame of own side. It can't be someone else's fault. Because I'm the one at fault because I'm the bad guy. I'm the bad gal. That's false nonsense. But that's what you've been feeling for years and years. That's one reason why it's so hard for people to admit someone else's fault. The second reason is because they were told by parents, literally by parents, not just a parent ego state, that you don't talk back. And we did the best we could, and you need to respect and appreciate all that we've done for you. And so to say mom or dad was at fault is to betray them, which is also nonsense. They should never have taught you that. No human being is perfect outside of the God-man Jesus. And so our parents have failed us. There's nothing wrong with saying, yeah, they blew it on that one. Other things were great, but that they blew. Man, they ruined it. I've told my children many times, I'm going to do the best job I can and pay for your therapy. <laughs> and I mean it. Oh no, Dad, y'all are phenomenal. Thank you so much. I know we're, I don't know where we're blowing it. I wouldn't be doing it on purpose. But that's why I've read so many books and got so many degrees. I mean, well, in this area, I've specialized to read as parents I can, but there's no way I'm doing it perfectly. There's no way. There's no way. So I, I'm, at some point in life, you're going to, as you grow up, you're going to have that stage of, they could have done a better job of this. And your answer is probably right. And I'm trying to do the best I can based on my horrible upbringing sometimes, and then the education, trying to correct those problems. But that's it. So it's okay. It's a good thing to say, boy, they taught me wrong on that. They taught me wrong on that. I was helpless. I had to learn that to fit in. And if I didn't fit in, that felt dangerous. That's trauma. I have to go along. I have to accept that molestation. Though it's something me tell me this ain't right. What do I do? That's my uncle. What do I do? That's so-and-so. They said, and so we, we have to. It feels dangerous and helpless, and that's trauma. And we spend the rest of our life. That wounded child's like, I need attention. Is physical um, molestation worse than mental? Good or question. Is physical molestation worse than mental? I've read that. I'm, I'm not certain, but I have read therapists that say that emotional and mental uh, abuse is worse than physical molestation. Yeah, yeah. I believe that. I, I've read that. Because it depends on the situation, but it tends to be easier to get over depending on the nature of the thing. Um, but yes, it depends. That's why I still can't sing. <laughs> why you still can't sing? I, can sing. Or I, I had a teacher say, you can't match tones. And mm. I don't even cry. So I had a teacher that told you that. See, that's, yeah, I hear you, it's sad. To put some kind of, quote, truth in your mind. Okay, well, I'm going to live up to that standard because they said I can. It's true, people say that. 
I've had people, the stuff people have said to me that their parents have said, it's unbelievable the wretched things I've heard. Teachers have said them. I worked with a guy, I was, I worked at a restaurant called Crystal. It's like White Castle, I'm small little burgers and hot dog, I've heard of this before. I was in Nashville, Tennessee, worked there for a year and a half, and we had, there was a, a, a home nearby for troubled youth, and everyone saw we get a batch of them that would come into work uh, with us, and they were interesting, uh, colorful language. In summer school, this one guy was real nice. You could tell right off that he tried his best to ingratiate because he was nice, but he was kind of rough on the edges. But he he was sweet, but you could tell he's been through some trauma. And so I tried to befriend them and try to be a Christian and so forth. And I remember specifically, I was sitting right by the burger place. He was by the fries, and we were chatting and whatnot. And we were talking about life and something. He, and every once in a while, you would tell the trauma would come through. Now, as a what was I, 16 years old, I was thinking this is trauma. I thought something's wrong. He's been through something. You know, I didn't have the working vocabulary. But he said, yeah, and he's a laugh out. Yeah, yeah. I remember one time I was little, my, uh, I was in the ground. My dad looked over at me and goes, he said a different word. Dang, I should have wore a condom. And that, and I, I froze. And he went, <laughs> he got a giggle about it. I said, I am, that is horrible. I'm so sorry he said that. And he went, oh, yeah. I said, no, really? That's horrible. You're valuable. You're lovable. I mean, the stuff people have heard, I mean, studies demonstrate how horrible. So yeah, mental stuff goes on all the time, and that's, there's no telling. To this day, he probably struggles completely worthless. To this day. Because he's in a helpless state. It's a sad deal. That grief is real. And all of us need a hero. And sometimes a hero has to be you now as you grow up say, you know what? And sometimes we have to borrow that hero language from a therapist, a counselor, a friend to say, stop it. Um, some people in this room, I have begged them every time, every single time they start talking junk about them. So I say, please stop saying bad things about yourself. Please stop. Please stop. It's mean. It's mean. If you were saying to someone else, I'd ask you to stop. You're saying to yourself, please love yourself. Please. Please, please, please. Someone's got to stand up for you now. And if I'm going to be the one, praise God, I'll be that person. But I'm going to stand up for you against yourself. Please don't say that stuff. Grieving is okay. It's okay to be sad. These are good questions. Especially, how do I do it? So that's what grief is. Loss, and disappointment. Why do we do it? It's a gift. It allows us to let go and process things. Come to some kind of acceptance in life. Well, then how do I do it? Okay, this is where we're going to uh, spend some time and, of course, you know, slow down and whatnot. Uh, specialists have different ways of speaking about grief. And that's true. You can read a lot of different books on this. It's common to believe that grief, however, comes in different stages, which can overlap. They can exist concur concurrently. They can be omitted. You can skip skips. It, so it's not an exact science because you're human beings. It's just not the same as you're going to go to a factory, A, B, C, D, F. It's not like that. But most people do suffer and experience grief in similar patterns. There are similarities in their patterns. That's why when you counsel people, you know how to go through the patterns. It means don't feel dumb or guilty if you don't do all the patterns. It just means these are standard. So the classic approach by Dr. Elizabeth Cooper ross she did a book on death and dying, is the classic. And since then, specialists have given more nuance and all kinds of stuff to her study, but these are the common five you've always talked about. This was developed when studying how people often responded to death. So when she talked to people at funeral homes, hospitals, and so forth, they typically responded to these big, these big areas, denial, bargaining, anger, despair, and acceptance. Uh, it's best to accept these stages rather than to fight them off or to ignore them. And knowledge, was that G.I. Joe winning it? Knowing is half the battle? Now, what you say, G.I. Joe? Knowing is half the battle. I mean, come on now. I watched that when I was a kid. Knowing is half the battle. And I, it helped me tremendously when I learned this. And I'm actually degree, I guess, so I was thinking, oh, so I should be looking for these stages in grief. And it's okay to feel these things? Yes. So here's some major stages. Again, you read of the books, have 12 stages and 10 stages. There's charts, all kinds of cool stuff. But since this is not a this is not a seminary, you know, it's not a national level course on this stuff. We're just giving an overview. And the first is denial. Denial is part of grieving. Denial says we can deny the loss has ever occurred. The very first thing most people say when you go through a traumatic experience is no. Have you ever heard that before? No, 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 no. In movies, TV shows, even your own life, the first thing is usually no, no. It's denial. That's called denial. This is not happening to me. This is not happening to me. That's the brain's response to the trauma of the second is denial because I can't go there. I just can't go there. We've heard people say that before. <laughs> when my daughter was younger, well, this is not, but like a couple years ago, it was, we were in Florida. 
And she said she told Hayden she was, and he, we still rag her. She still, we still tease her. She goes, I physically and emotionally can't deal with this right now. I physically and emotionally can't deal with you. It's her boundaries. And so to this day, Hayden will still go, I physically and emotionally. No, no. <laughs> Bless her heart. 12 year old. It's tough when you're 12, 13. Now she's 14, I think. So uh, that's denial. Dollars, we know, no, no, no. It is. It is. People who stay in denial state, they can stay there forever. Nope, never happened. And when it does it for real, we call it the technical as repressed memory. Particularly when traumatized as babies or as children, a lot of times don't even remember that they were raped. Remember they were tortured. Remember they just, nope, it's so repressed. They've denied it altogether. Don't even go there anymore. The brain can't handle it. Nope. We can, ignore, we can ignore that it happened. We can ignore the severity of the offense. It wasn't that big a deal. Well, you, know, you know, they tried their best. That's the best they knew. They didn't mean to. We do our best to excuse it so that they don't look bad and we don't have to really go there. Now, maybe it's true it wasn't that bad, but typically in denial, it's a way for us not to have to go there. We just don't want to talk about the sadness, so we, it was that bad. Yeah, that, that sounds right, so move on to life. Go to work, pick yourself up, drink your coffee. So we can do that, that's denial. We can avoid the person or the situation to pretend it never occurred. That's a form of denial. And we can get stuck in a need to know why. No, 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 until you tell me why. And in that sting that's stuck in that stage, I say this, this is pretty common to say, we get stuck in the protest stage. That's part of denial, the protest. No, until you tell me why. And I've said many times, and I'll always say it, at least as long as I'm here, you'll hear me say this. If you're waiting for God to tell you why everything happened in your life before you trust him, then you will never trust him. I've never met a human in my life, never seen a Bible verse that promised that God will reveal to us why everything happens the way it does. So you'll wait. And some, of you, some people are like, that's fine with me. Nope. I'm not going to even talk about that pain until I know why it happened. And that's normal. But if you stay there, it was unhealthy. It's sad. Your child's going to say, I still get attention. All right. Well, all right. Well, I'll get attention somehow by depression, loss of appetite, give you a new addiction. That's what wounded children do. They give you addictions. They're getting attention. And you're trying to deny it by drinking it away, sexing it away, drugging it away, shop it away, eat it away. That's denial. Instead, what we need to do as healthy individuals is we need to identify deliberately the loss of experience. Identify it. Name it. Be specific. That's how you get over the denial process and stage. What happened? That's why a really good therapist at some point, depending on the level of the trauma, depending on the level of trust, at some point is going to say... So whenever you feel comfortable, tell me, why don't you tell me what happened? Because we're trying to help you acknowledge it did happen. And then you have, secondly, a second person in the room who's a safe place with you as you identify it. They're a nurturing parent and an adult. They're not going to be a critical parent. And most people who come to talk to me in all my years of ministry, they are scared to death of being judged. I need to come, I know, I know, I know, I didn't want to, I know, but I, just, oh, I was so scared to come to you because if I came to you, I just knew because they live in a constant child ego state. There's, the, only, the only parent they know is a critical parent. That's all they really know in their mind. And so I guarantee, so they see the world as anyone out the world is all critical parents. And so if I show my weakness or my woundedness or whatever, they're just going to take advantage of me or tell me to suck it up or they'll, they'll call it discounting. They're like, that doesn't matter. That wasn't a big deal. And that's very sad because people have learned that in life. The problem is it's not true that everyone's a critical parent. There actually are nurturing parents in the world. And you'll know you meet within a few seconds. I know these people. They are so encouraging. There's a, there's a warmth and safety about them. This is, come on, baby, it's okay. Now, you can stay there all the time and they become rescuers. They don't want people to ever suffer neck emotions. That's not healthy either. I know a lot of rescuers. No, 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 look on the bright side, be blessed, be blessed, Zig Ziglar, the just, you know, left and right Bible verse, Bible verse, uh, uh. that's a, the rescuers, because they feel anxious that you're sad, and, so, and that means they're a wounded child, their child's being, uh, this makes you upset that the person's upset, and I don't know how to deal with my being upset, so I got to control you, so you'll stop being upset, and so a lot of people like, they'll just bend over backwards, a lot of times bending over backwards, not because they're Christian like Jesus, altruistic, it's because they're anxious, and they have process or anxiety. And they feel better about themselves when you calm down. So safe people are not like that either. They're just sweet, nurturing parents. Like, it's okay not to be okay. 
It's okay to be sad around me. And so denial can be gotten over by putting our finger as we're on it and saying, that's what happened to me. Maybe that's 300 things. Any question about denial? Or how to get over it? Anything about naming it, not claiming it? <laughs> naming and claiming it. Identifying it. Denial is not a river in Egypt. Yeah, ours, denial is not just a river in Egypt. That's right. <laughs> yeah, denial is not just a river. That's right. My, my pastoral care and counseling professor used to say that. Denial is just... Used to say, whining is not a spiritual gift. Yeah. <laughs> used to say all kinds. <laughs> he was crazy. When I first met him, oh, he drove me crazy. He drove me crazy, made me so mad. Oh, it's because he read me like a book as soon as I met him. I mean, he was a trained therapist. He had uh, almost a second earned PhD in counseling in Russia, but he would have to pay a whole lot of money to get translated. Like, I'm not doing all that. Uh, but yeah, so I thought, but after about, I don't know how many months it was, it dawned on me, he's doing this on purpose. And all of a sudden, I fell in love with him. I mean, I just, I did. So he was that guy who just, he'd look at you, boom, he'd be there, he's good. Any question or comments about denial in the river in Egypt? Anybody? Anybody at all? Okay, let me ask you this question. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this before I move on. And you don't have to say yes, but if you do, it's worth spending a few minutes on it. Does anyone in here have a hard time acknowledging the pain that's, been, that's happened to you? Any kind of trauma in your past? You don't tell us what the trauma is if you don't want to, but... Have you found it difficult sometimes to go, yeah, it's hard for me sometimes to really own that that really happened or that I'm really sad about that or that event really happened. I never really visited that event. I know all my trauma. All your trauma? You do know it or so you don't have a problem with it? I don't have a trauma. Gotcha. I know all my trauma. You know all your trauma. Okay, so, so the answer to you is, no, I know all of it. <laughs> good. Good. Well, that's good. I'm sad that you're traumatized, but that's good. Anybody ever have a difficulty with it ever? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, it's still... so, so losing two children after years apart, that's all, that's a, that is a lot of trauma. And, that's a good, and, and losing children is, from what I understand, like research, it is probably the most traumatic, the worst thing a person can go through. It is, it's like waking up, you don't have an arm anymore the rest of your life. It's, you know, it's gone. Um, and I've known many people who've lost children, many from babies to adults to, I mean, it just it is a terrible, terrible tragedy. And sometimes that pain is so real, we stay in a state of denial. We don't want to go back and realize it really happened. And one of the signs of, and there's ways to manifest denial, like keeping the room as it was when they died, before they died, never changing the clothes, never changing the calendar, never taking the voicemail off, never doing it, because that's denial. That's, I cannot accept that he or she is gone. That's the acceptance. So that's denial. I don't drive there anymore. I don't go there. I, I mean, it's just, I keep it out there. I deny it, I deny it, I deny it. And that's normal. But if we stay there all the time, then the portion of the means you're staying in it, your wounded child's not getting enough attention. So early on, initially, it's very, very normal. Does it ever okay. happen that you have trauma and and you don't even realize you don't remember it because yes, your mind is yes, just totally shut it out? Now, how do you get somebody to face that? I mean, or to to try to deal with that great question so can we be traumatized and a person not remember it at all it basically gets so suppressed that we don't remember absolutely absolutely the answer is yes that it does happen there's a real that's a great question there's a real risk that therapists will tell you good ones will tell you and this because this is very true that it's a risk trying to recall traumatic memories that you do not remember because humans have a huge tendency or predilection to what we call ad confabulations to make up false memories called confabulations because we're very suggestible human beings and so a good thing particularly in hypnosis not that all hypnosis is bad i'm saying so were you smelling something when that happened yeah what was it I mean, was they can suggest things that were very impressionable all of us are I mean, that study i didn't just said about i mean just any time ever a little quick footnote on that to demonstrate how impressionable we are I've seen studies on this. One study I saw, these people, probably about six or seven people, middle-aged, I think they were all white, come to think about it, I don't know why I had to be all that, but they were, and they were getting this yogurt, and they said, what do y'all think about this strawberry yogurt? You're going to test out the tongue. I think about it. So after they tasted it, it was good, they finished it, what do you think about it? They're going, oh, it's fantastic. One said, you could really, really taste the strawberry. It's amazing. So it was really good. Mine said, well, I, I taste a little bit, not a whole lot. So, oh, this is fantastic. 
And the interviewer said, what if I told you it was a strawberry? It was just plain yogurt. Some of them started like, what? And I was like, no, it wasn't. Yes, it was. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. No, it wasn't. I tasted strawberry. Good for you. That's plain yogurt. We told you it was strawberry. We called it like rich strawberry or something like that. And so they had the studies that over and over, they've done studies where people will tell them potato soup at universities and rename it mama's pancake, uh, potato soup or grandma's soup. And the, it goes up like 300%. I mean, it's some gargantuan exponential just because of a name. We're so suggestible. So the same thing true all the time. So good therapists typically will say, um, if they meet with a person for a while, and I mean, I've done this myself, if they meet with a person for a while and it probably, through the things the person says, you can tell something happened in childhood. We explore it some, but what I do typically then, or people will do, is do exploratory questions. Now, that's not my specialty. There are real specialists on this, but the research I've done and what I've done, they can know their suppressed memories, and they'll try to touch on stuff as much as they need to. But there's no real need to go back to every single event that happened so that they can move on. My therapist professor used to say, that same guy who's denial and all that stuff, uh, the analogy was great. He said, the, you, don't know how, you don't need to know how the fire started to put it out. And those are two different processes, right? There are, they really are. One is to put the fire out and one is to figure out how it started. Now, it is great to learn how it started in case it wants to start again. That's true, but you don't need to know that to put the fire out. And so that to me is awesome because when I do my therapy work with people, including my own self, I can work on putting the fire out. And they might say, where that seed came from? Maybe we can't determine it was a grandmother. Maybe we can't determine where it came from. Maybe we can't. We go, okay, but right now, what can we do now to learn coping mechanisms to process that anxiety or, or trauma? Um, so, yeah, it can. There are some therapists who say, no, you've got to find out. You need hypnosis. You've got to go back and find out exactly what happens. But most people, most therapists will, will say, no, you don't want to act because you don't want to. You can cause trauma's not even there. Um, but it's a good question. But the answer is, yeah, we sure can. In severe cases of childhood trauma, there's such severe dissociation, they develop disassociative personalities, which is why we call that disassociative disorder, um, identity, uh, DID, disassociative identity disorder. And so the conscious, the ego state, the adult state, and chill adult, they split off to alter egos. And it's a way to, it's a form of denial, it's a way to protect the child. And there's people when they've been tortured as babies, urinated on, all kinds of stuff, and they will literally have no memory until they're in uh, the ego state of what happened, and that, that ego state barely comes out to play. And sometimes the people with this, uh, that's what we call schizophrenia, not, has nothing to do with schizophrenia. That's uh, uh, disassociative identity disorder, DID. It used to be called personality disorder, or personality identity disorder, but now they call it DID. Anyway, all that to say it's a defense mechanism. So if they allow that child who really happened, uh, to, to whom it happened, come out, there's a, you know, the terror and grief and trauma because it's still in the person. But they don't go there because it's so, they've just split, and so it's suppressed it. And they've done this, sometimes you do this, people with DID draw pictures. Depending on what ego state they're in, they'll draw pictures that look radically right different, like a four-year-old or a 30-year-old or a 20-year-old. Their spelling, their vocabulary, their speech, their uh, language skills change depending on the ego state. And when they're not in that ego state, the, the one, the, the original victim, they don't remember what happened. So though I saw this on the show one time, they asked the woman, she showed this picture of a painting that she had done that was, it's good therapy for people sometimes to try to get to that stuff from childhood. Just draw me a picture of your childhood, what happened? And if they're in a certain ego state, they might draw some horrible thing of a kid with four people all around them, they're in a cage or they're chained up or whatever. And they're in a different ego state, they'll say, how do you feel? I'm an interviewer, so how do you feel when you see that picture? And she goes, oh, it's horrible. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't, whatever that happened to you, that's sad. I mean, they didn't deserve, that's sad. Like they had no awareness happened to them because they're not in that ego state. That have, that's such disassociation, it's so suppressed that the brain, that's, I think, God's way of saying, I'm not gonna let you even think about the pain anymore. You were so, um, now to integrate those different ego states, there's in, 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 integrative therapy that you work on trying to go back to talk about, get the healing and all these different split things to come together. Um, anyway, so yeah, it can be real bad. That disassociation is real bad because of the trauma, not because they're all, but anyway, that's it, okay, so denial is that not just a river, name it, be specific. That is very important. So let me say this, I'll move on real quickly. Just in case you ever struggle with this, or those who are listening online, or the podcast or watching online, it is so important that you allow yourself permission to identify the pain. You need to identify the loss, no matter how silly a part of your voice tells you it is. Please tell that silly voice to, sh gotta be quiet, uh, to be quiet. 
that's not true, that it's not a big deal. If it happened, it happened. Identify it. Give yourself permission to name and claim, be specific of what was done to you. No matter how minor or major it is, put light right on it. If that scares you to death, do that with a good therapist in the room. A good journal can do a lot of stuff too. But don't deny it. B, bargaining. We can try to make a deal with God or others to fix their problem or address the loss. Hey, 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 uh, uh, I'll do anything, I'll do anything, I'll do whatever. Just don't do blank. That's bargaining. I'll do whatever just as long as you pay me. I'll do whatever as long as you don't leave me. I'll, 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 I'll everything. I'll, I'll, we do it to God. I'll go to church the rest of my life. Just don't let me get caught. We can make, uh, we can take impetus risk, or, sorry, I'm sorry, impetuous, my glasses. We, we take impetuous risks to gamble or something that acts like a quick replacement for our loss. That's bargaining. I'm going to give this for that, this for that. That's very, very common too. It's kind of like if someone you love has an affair, breaks up with you, there's a strong desire to go be with someone else right away. Go straight to the bar and sleep with the first person you see. It's like I'm swapping that pain of what you did for this. I'll swap real fast. I'm not bargaining. And we do that with God a lot. It's the, what made you come to church? Well, I told God, if you ever got me out of that, and then how many people really do it? You know what I'm saying? Because in the moment, it's just, I, it's kind of like denial, but it's bargaining. I'm not going to go there. But if I have to, anyway. Instead, what we need to do is to make, we, we need not to make, need not to make any significant decisions while grieving. Any of them. Don't move. Don't buy a car. You don't bargain. You don't buy another husband or a wife right off the bat. That's why over 80% of second marriages fail. Over 80%. The pendulum swings so far the other way that they just don't make it. Because they weren't in love with the person, they were escaping the pain from before. Over 80%. That's horrible. The third marriage is like down to over 50%. So it does better, but it's still not very good. But anyway. Learning upon, tr leaning upon trusted friends and family is crucial in our attempt to stay rational. And I, I encourage everybody, especially if you're going through real serious trauma, I beg them, please, I need to move right now. I just need to, okay, you might need to, but can you please take a break? Please, 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 you breathe, sleep on a little bit. I'm here with you as well. Now, it's different if your house on fire, or you've lost everything, you need a place to live. I get it. But I just can't go back there because she, her, her, she's everywhere. Well, not yet. Okay, right now, go stay at a hotel. Right now, stay with us. Stay with somebody. Please hold on. Please. Why don't you buy a new car right now? Because he always made fun of me. Hold on. Men and women go get augmentation. Well, I'll show him. It's like as quick as possible. I replace that loss with. So let's don't do that. You don't make God any promises. Any bargaining questions? If you give me a question, I'll bargain with you. I'll give you an answer. <laughs> No, anger. We can become angry with others, <coughs> ourselves, and with God. I mean, atheist. It's so weird to meet an angry atheist. Who are you mad at? Who are you mad at? And they are mad. <coughs> They're mad. We can become angry with the grieving process. I don't want to be sad. I don't want to go through this. I don't want to go to therapy. I know that very much when I did physical therapy on my shoulder. I had adhesive capsulitis. I'm lying on a table. I was <coughs> doing this over and over and over for six weeks. It hurt so badly. I'd laugh. He goes, what are you laughing? I said, is that a cry, man? I'd be sweating. I don't really ever sweat. I'd be sweating. It hurt so much. Because this exterior rotation. I was mad at it. I was mad at the, th the process. And the only thing that kept me on that table, the only thing that kept me on that table, I had to pay for that. I had to pay to get tortured. Outside of a state of Massacus, who does that? The only thing that kept me on that table was I knew, because I trusted, I trusted, People I thought were specialists who told me I'd get the mobility back. So to use a Christian term, that pain was redemptive. I trusted people. I didn't believe them. I'm like, yeah, whatever. But hope, okay, okay. They, they're specialists and they do this all the time. And that's why we're off the bat. Will I get, is this worth it? Like, what can I, what should I expect? Well, you don't get, but you do the homework. You go, but really? Like, I want to see the end result. When I do therapy with people all the time, well, uh, what's, I'm telling you, if you can trust me at all, like I trust physical therapists, if you do the homework, I guarantee you, you will feel so much better throughout this process. I guarantee you. But it hurts. It does hurt. It makes me sweat and cry. Yes, it does. It's not fun at all. No, it's not. But it does get better. It does. And we get mad at ourselves, mad at people, mad at the process itself. 
We can vent our rage on people who represent our laws. Family, friends, doctors, clergy, rehabilitation specialists. You look at people in the hospitals after like war and PTSD and they're just cussing out the person who's saying, one more step, you can do it. Leave me the alone. Oh, they're mad. They're mad at the process and that person is representative of that pain. They are. I, um, I was one of the elders in a previous church uh, was our literal next door neighbor. And it was, uh, she was a woman and her, our family was there active in the church. And uh, I got a call from God's favorite restaurant, Cracker Barrel. We were eating breakfast and they got a call that the son had been through some issues that a lot that we had known about. Things seemed to be going better. We got a text from him that says that he tried to commit suicide. He's at the hospital. And so we ate as fast as we could, paid the bill. And on the way back out there, we brought 20 minutes away. On the way there, Texas said he died. So I show up to the hospital on a Saturday morning, like mid-morning, and we're the only ones in the waiting room. I come in, of course, they see me, they're on the floor, they're, they start weeping, and you do stuff pastors do, and then I was there with them right off the bat, well, why did this happen, why, and so forth. And at first, I mean, we were there, we walked with them as long as we could. I would sit in the kitchen, and all that stuff, we would talk and talk through the years. That's, through the months and months, I'd see them out walking, we'd pray for all that kind of stuff. And after about, I don't know, probably eight to 10 months or so, roughly, her grieving and denial turned toward rage toward me. She'd start making a lot more smart like comments and so forth. And then after about 10 months to a year of that, roughly, like on Facebook, I'd put stuff, just all kinds of stuff, trying to encourage the people I was, I was a pastor at the time. Things like, you know, it's okay to be sad. All the kinds of stuff you process. It wasn't about her. It was just general statements of whatever. And she would write comments all the time on Facebook, just real smart. Like, and eventually she says really, really smart like comments. And that was it. I had to, I had to unfriend her. I had to block her because she got, she was, just real punky. And I knew all along what's happening is she's turned a punk because she's mad at me because if I represent, I represent God and she's still mad at God. And we used to have those conversations. Why would God? And I kept saying, I mean, respectfully, God has nothing to do with this. God did not make your son do that. He's not to blame for that choice. He made the choice on his own, his free will. But see, she felt that kind of trauma, she couldn't go there. No, because he's an angel. And she knew he wasn't. But in grief, you, when you grieve, we call idealize, we idealize a person. And that's why almost all eulogies they were the most loving person you've ever met. What? Have you met Uncle Bob? He was not the loving person. He was just there for you. And that's part of the healing process. He's the best thing ever walked on water. And that's what happens. We deal with because we, that's how we, one way we process. It helps us feel like we don't feel as badly. We're honoring their memory. And so we don't feel as badly about ourselves. So that's what she did with her son. Well, then someone's got to be blamed. Someone's got to be blamed because he didn't do it. Well, God is. And David's the pastor. And it's his fault to them. And so I got all the heat. And it hurt my feelings. I got over it, but it hurt my feelings a lot because of the, the stuff she said. I mean, it was very, very mean. It was very mean. I knew she was sad. I knew she was in the trauma, but I didn't deserve it at all. But that's a sign of the anger issues that we can internalize and, and put it on. I mean, put it on. Did that ever get reconciled? No. No, her husband uh, did well. I would see him walk. And after about one year, which we'll talk about in a little bit later on, uh, after about one year, which is standard, after about a rough year of that, uh, he said he came out of that deep, deep sadness, depression that you go through when you lose a child. And it's rough, usually it's roughly a year, and he said, the fog is it cleared. And so he's now in that, the deep state of despair and depression. And so we talked and prayed for him and whatnot, but I tell him, everybody, I didn't tell him what she said, but I would say once in a while, she seems to be really angry, yeah, she's struggling, that kind of stuff. And then they had another son who had some, was on the spectrum, and I would talk to him, but yeah, the mom just, um, that was it. There's nothing I could do about it. I couldn't, I mean, I would send encouraging messages. I'm so sorry you're hurting. Would you like to talk to all that kind of stuff? She didn't want to have it. And, that's unfortunate. It is unfortunate. And I, I, and I, and I think about hope, pray that she's healed more by now. So they can do that. We can bend other people who represent our loss, that's for sure. We can internalize the anger of our loss and maintain an attitude of condemnation and shame. Like, I keep beating myself over and over and over and over and over for what I did. I didn't see it. I didn't see the signs. I should have done this. I should have done this. When people are molested, they'll blame themselves. I shouldn't have been cute. I should have been pretty. I should have been asleep. I shouldn't have worn that skirt. I shouldn't have worn that this. I should have known with him. I should have known. I should have obeyed more and this wouldn't have happened. Mom's rage and anger. I should have been a good boy. I should have it just mad at ourselves. That's part of the grieving process. And that's so sad and ridiculous. You did nothing wrong. Sometimes we say of sadness, it is our fault. Like I chose to go get drunk and then I caused the death of the drunk. I was, I was that drunk driver and then we're mad at ourselves over and over and over. That, that, it feels good and feels right to beat ourselves up over and over and over. That's part of the, that's not good, it's not healthy, but it's at the time it feels like we're supposed to. 
It can also be fast help to maintain a disposition of anger, look for others who will also share in your rage. And that's why when you have people who really go, I'm so mad, I'm so mad. What you don't want to do, a lot of well-intentioned friends do this. So you should be mad. Ticks me off too. That son of a blah, blah, blah. They go on. Now we're both mad. And then, all right, love you, talk to you later. Like that, all you do is ramping them up. So there's not helping a process. You're just getting ramped up. So what we need to do is you validate the anger, the rage, and the sadness. But again, almost all anger is just a way to hide woundedness. So some anger is righteous indignation, right? Overturning the money changers' temple, right? That temple, remember Jesus. So he's not personally wounded that the person hurt his feelings. It's not just a right that they're doing this. Sometimes we feel that anger. We watch things on the news. We feel people getting raped or whatever it is. It happens to us. Happens to other people. That's normal. But most anger we experience during the day in our lives is not that kind of anger. It's just a defense mechanism. It's a defense mechanism so that we don't want to feel sad. We don't want the wounded child to go there. We're protecting ourselves from giving the wounded child attention. Why? Because it's sad. Why? Because it's not happy. Why? Because I don't want to feel those negative emotions. So I'll just stay mad. And this is extremely acceptable with men. The one emotional state, there's two emotional states, basically, no, three, that men are given permission to fill in society. Uh, hunger, you know, sleep, and anger. Why is my second other one? But anyway, so emotional, yeah, it's just general, that's it. They don't know, they're not permission to fill. You know, they, they can feel happy, but in general, they don't feel sad. They don't, they're not supposed to. They can feel anger, and that's just silly. Anger is one of the many emotions we're supposed to feel. But in our anger stage, it can feel right just to stay anger. It's kind of like a form of denial, too, just like bargaining. This is a way of saying, no, I'm not going to allow myself to validate the emotional pain. So instead of doing this, instead of being mad at other people, instead of mad at ourselves, instead of mad, in, mad and just staying in that disposition, we must express our anger in appropriate ways. There are ways to do that. Like journaling your anger. Tell a trusted person how angry you are. Tell God how angry you are. Say it. And if you, if you don't have even one trusted, I'm serious about this, a lot of people do not. If you don't have one trusted safe friend with whom you are safe to be angry around, then come talk to me, I'll be your friend. You've got to find at least one person who is okay to be really, really ticked off. What you do not want to find or be around, I've met so many people that say, my friend said, why not, why did, that's not a friend to you. Well, I started saying how mad I was, they said, are you a Christian? Have you prayed about it? Do you have faith? And it's just, we don't, we don't need that. When you're hurting and grieving, what the other person needs from you is a nurturing parent. For a little bit. And then they help you get to your adult state. It's not how we process it together, how we move on. But you need someone to be a safe person there. So you can journal it, tell trust a friend, tell God, and do. No, I would never tell God I'm mad at him. Why not? The psalmist did, basically. I mean, they did. Are you asleep up there? What's wrong with you? Are you asleep? Why don't you come to my aid? Why are my enemies gloating over me? Aren't you going to do something? You said you're faithful. It sounds like they're pretty mad at God. You think God's not big enough to handle your emotions? Well, I know he is. But the reason why you don't think he is is because you learned from a parent. Your parent was not allowed. They weren't able to handle your anger. And they said things like this. Don't talk back. Children are meant to be seen, not heard. And so we were taught, if that's what you heard, you were taught that any opinion against mom or dad any expression of negative emotion toward them, something they did to you, is a sign of disrespect, which means you feel bad about you. You were ashamed for having a feeling of anger. That was wrong of them. They should never have taught you that. I tell my children their entire lives, when they were, as soon as they could talk, I mean, I'm telling you, as soon as it is always okay to be mad at me, and especially your mom. Because <laughs> she deserves it. I, did, I tell them all the time, it's okay to be angry with me. They kind of get, first they're like, huh? We, I would try my best to teach them a uh, feeling vocabulary. I feel, I said, well, hold, think about it. How do you feel? And they can't think that I would give them, you give them choices. You say, do you feel happy? No. You feel, and you just give them, you know what they're not happy. You're trying to help them process it, feeling vocabulary. Uh, but when I was at, you know what you're mad at me? You can be mad at me. I would, all the time I would tell them. I look at my eyeballs. You can be angry with me because I guarantee you, your, our relationship is not at stake. I will love you no matter how mad you are at me. I want you to be mad at me sometimes. That means I'm being a good parent. Because I mean, I said the word that you don't want to hear, which is no. No one wants to hear the word no. No one wants to hear it. But I do want to say it because I love you too much. Well, so you're going to be mad when I say the word no. And they'll kind of giggle like, yeah, I guess. I said, that's fine. I'm okay with that. That's because I don't need you. 
to fill my emotional needs. You're not my parent. You're not my friend. You're not my Lord Jesus. You're not my boss. I'm not your buddy. I'm your parent. And that means I can talk. I have a very high tolerance of your anger. I have a very high tolerance. I do. I have a very high tolerance. I don't want you to be mad at me. Does it bring me joy? Yes, he's mad. That's what Paul says in Ephesians. Fathers don't provoke your children to anger. It doesn't make me glad to push their buttons. Not at all. But if they're mad because of something I think is a righteous decision, like, no, you can't hit your sister, you can't lick your brother, or whatever it might be. No, you can't have 14 boxes of Pop-Tarts. No, okay. I love you too much, or whatever it might be. Ooh, yeah, you can be mad at me. So, and what do I do instead? What I, what I teach my children? You can be mad, you just can't do it that way. Here's how you can do it. So for example, in our home, um, it was an absolute law. If I were in line to meet the Lord Jesus, I would have pulled my son out of the line to re reprimand him on this issue. That's physical violence. You do not hit. You don't hit, you don't kick, you spit, ever. And same thing with Julia. And the, I don't care where I was. I don't care what I was doing. If I saw that, we're gonna have a, we had a timeout talk is what I called it. That was a come to Jesus talk. Which might have ended in a small banking, but we don't express anger that way. We do not express. Now we talk about it. You can be angry. You don't show that way. You can talk, use your words. You can da da da. You can even raise your voice. You can't scream out of control, but you can raise your voice. That means you're passionate. I'm okay with that. That's okay. My household to raise your voice. You don't have to talk like this all the time because I'm not that fragile. But if you start screaming or yelling, it's, you, so we tell them this stuff. Most people aren't taught those ways how to express it. When I talk, they go, "Man, that makes me mad." <laughs> I'll be fine, let me breathe it off a little bit. Most people are even taught those basic skill sets. You either deny it, you stuff it, or you rage. Push the button. A lot of people who have their rage problems, they were never taught how to handle it in baby steps because they're not being mindful. And all through the day, just slowly but surely, someone took a parking spot, and I got bust out, and the check didn't come in, and da 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 and all of a sudden, They should have expressed it anger along the way. But they didn't, because they don't know how to. This is a skill set issue. So you need to express how hard for ways. That's right, got kicked the cat, mad at you. Dumb cat. I have almost done that. I mean, it's funny how that's true. I almost, or the dog. It's a funny Sam how. Had a, it's so funny. A story that he gave. I mean, it's long since passed, but yeah. He was a motivational speaker. Oh, yeah, yeah. He told the story of like, taking the cat. Let's go ahead. Everything go wrong with him that day, and, and uh, how did it go? He come home and he kicked the cat, and he. He said to the guy, now, if you uh, get this day over with, just go ahead and kick the cat. Then you forget about all that other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> just kick that cat. Well, yeah, like the dad gets all the stuff, comes home, snaps at his wife, wipes, snap, then eventually snaps the kids, kid him in and goes to kiss the cat. That is just, just transfers of all this. And that is so common and unhealthy. Woo! I mean, no one in the family household has the ability to, to express their anger. Yeah. So the moral of the story is find a cat tonight. <laughs> Start kicking. So keep expressing your anger in order to release it. Do not move from person to person, to person to person to person to stroke the flames of your rage. You don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. That actually doesn't help you. It's not like guilty. Christians don't. I mean, Christians should do that because in a sense you're just, you're making yourself spill over rage and rage and rage. I met people like that. They're just mad. They meet someone else. They're mad. They're mad at me. They're mad about that. They're mad about, they're always mad about something or upset about something. And look for the person. If you don't validate that anger and rage, they, whatever, they'll find someone else until they find that person. Um, that's different from talking to a trusted friend or therapist saying, I'm really, really, really angry with this. It ticks me off. Or I need to rage for a little bit. Not if you call the friend back 16 more times with the anger. Now, it depends on the issue. If someone has an affair, you're going to be mad for a while. But if you stay mad for years, you've not gone through the grieving process. That's the difference. Keep doing it. Don't look for first person. Moreover, absolutely avoid self medication. Alcohol, drugs, sex, food, shopping, these are not healthy coping mechanisms in your grieving process. They are not. There's a marriage workshop coming up in a few days, and that's one of the contracts people have to sign at the beginning is they will not do any alcohol, drugs, uh, overeating, over sex, whatever, during the process, because that's what we do when we want to not feel the woundedness. And sometimes the anger is so overwhelming. I just, uh, I just need to check the edge off. Good. Grab a journal. Good, talk to a friend. Good, go pray. Good, go scream at a pillow. Good, don't pick up that bottle. That is not a healthy coping mechanism. If God wants you to do that, you've been born with a beer bottle in your hand. Or a visa. That's not what you were born with. You were born with tear ducts and other people and other relationships. However painful it might be, and I, understand, I get it. Golly, I get it. 
I get it. It's just not a healthy coping mechanism. That does not help you grieve. It numbs the pain until you're conscious again, and then you feel all over again. It just doesn't heal it. It doesn't heal it. So that's a good homework assignment there on anger is how can you start expressing your anger and getting good at being aware of when you're mad? When you're being aware of when you're mad. And so this anger be like scared of one to ten, just barely, barely irritated to annoyance, to frustration, and so forth. All the anger, then all the way to rage is like nine and ten. How would you find yourself on that scale? What yeah. if everything just irritates you? Yeah, what if everything irritates you? <laughs> everything irritates you. You see his face. Then you must be Greg Peterson. I'm kidding. Oh, 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 oh say, I, Of course I'm kidding. St. Greg, I'm kidding. What if everything irritates you? If that's a good question. So what do you do with it or why? Well. Okay. I'll say what I'll do with it is first thing as usual, seriously, is own it. That is, do I really, am I being irritable right now? Am I being irascible? That is, up, just own it. Like in my home, we try our best to say, I've taught them over and over and over and over to say, are you, are you in a bad mood? Like, no, 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 I'm not. No, like, I'll always say, it's okay to be in a bad mood. Now, Elaine's a little different. She's coming along, but the kids have drilled in their heads. They'll, I go, I'll, they'll, oh, or she'll come to me and say, he's really fussy. He's really irritable. Here I go, good. I, would, I normal. It's, it's a mood. Moods come and go. Let him be irritable. It's a mood. He'll get out of it. If he was two years of this, that's not healthy. We'll talk, you know, but it's just a mood. He does get out of it. It's okay to be irritable sometimes. It's okay to be like, I'm just annoyed at everything. Yeah, that happens. So the first thing is owning it. The second thing is, okay, why am I irritable? What's going on? No matter how little it might have been, it doesn't matter. Something calls you, some grieving, some woundedness that's caused you to be on the edge. And so I guess I'm still mad about blah, blah. Okay, where are you mad? Talk about it. What were you mad about? So-and-so snapped at me. I didn't deserve it. You didn't deserve that. You're right. Does that make anybody angry? Does that make you sad too a little bit when you get the anger past the anger? Yeah, it does. I get sad because that may even hurt my feelings. I'm sorry your feelings. I shouldn't know that either. A lot of times we're on the edge is because we just got some grieving. The wounded child is just, ir just irritated, and we got to go back and figure out what happened. If you can't figure out what happened, you go, okay, well, I'm just irritated. Maybe it's just a mood. Maybe it's biochemistry. I mean, ladies, I know, you know once a month, a lot of women just get irritable. Their hormones go great. There's not going to be a big cosmic reason, just biochemical. Sometimes guys go through the same thing. Biochemistry just changes. She feels more irritable, just feel in a bad mood. A lot of times, not getting enough sleep can do that. Sometimes people have sleep apnea. They don't realize they don't sleep well. They snore a lot. And so they're always on edge because their brain just hasn't calmed down yet, hasn't refreshed. That sleeping period is a time for the brain to calm and refresh and get rebooted. If you don't sleep well, that can cause such irritability. Um, there could be other chemical issues going on, drug reactions. I mean, all those causes can lead to that. Um, so I tend not to make a big deal. Another thing that can cause ir being irritable or being complaining all the time is one of two major things. One is learned behavior. If we had a parent, like I'm not pointing because I'm saying another example. Uh, because some people have parent or authority figure who are like that all the time. They're just fussing all the time. And so children think that's how the world works. I'm supposed to fuss all the time. This is what we do. So if I were a therapist, if I were the therapist situation, I'd say, was there anybody in your life as a childhood that liked to complain? That's what I would ask. Anybody in your life like to complain? And uh, usually, I can't think. If they can't think, I'm fine. But they go, usually, or the opposite, they'll go, Oh, yeah, 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 my mom did all the time. Oh, there, that's, and you learn that. You learn how that's how the, you're supposed to react that way all the time. You learn that's what you're supposed to as a child. You were helpless, that's what you learn. But we can unlearn that. The other, another reason why people can be so irritable, complain a lot, is because when they're adults, is when they're children, they were not allowed to express complaints. And now the dams have broken. And now they're free to fuss all the time. Because I was a kid, I was told, look on the bright side, look on the bright side, look on the bright side, close your mouth, don't say that. And so now they feel free to do it. And basically what they're doing now is fussing all the time. Their wounded child is and genuinely, their wounded child's looking for validation. Is it okay if I'm mad? Is it okay if I'm ticked off? Will you still love me? Can someone validate the fact that I'm frustrated right now? So sometimes just going to a counselor or a good friend or spouse that says, you can be irritated. Sometimes it's a skill set issue. Like, I never thought about it. I guess I do make everything a big deal. It doesn't have to be. I can also choose to go, I'm gonna let that go. I don't want you to not be that upset. Not only everything happens to us in life, of course not. But most mild annoyances, yeah, you can. I preached on that a while back on anger. You know, most times we say, the first question is, is it, is it worth all that? I mean, think about it for a second. And here's a good way to get outside of yourself if you're kind of worked up and you're in your zone, the way to get out of yourself and call the observe itself. Think about this for a second. If someone else came up to you saying, man, that ticked me off, it didn't bring a Coke Zero. What would you say? Would you go, that is horrible. 
Where'd you go? What? So, so it's not like you said, anyone comes here. You're that mad? Why is that? I mean, if it's a third party perspective, you might go, is that disproportionate to what the issue is? And so if we can get ourselves outside of ourselves and pretend someone else said the same thing, we're irritated all the time out. Um, I think Dr. Phil used to say this, are you fun to live with? <laughs> yeah, like how fun are you? That well, some of us just don't see from the outside that they can be that way. And so sometimes getting a third party perspective, just pretending it. Yeah, sometimes that could happen. He brought me half of one. He brought me half of one. Now it's a quarter ounce of leftover <laughs> spit. But it's Coke Zero. I take it. I'm kidding. But then acid reflux, I drink them all the time. Uh, any questions or comments about that? I thought we'd maybe do the last one if we can, or maybe in there. What do you think? Feel a little more? You okay? Not mad at me? Always. <laughs> <laughs> I, of all the ones I struggle with the most in my life because of my childhood, by far it's anger. I was not allowed to express negative emotions toward a parent in my home, and I was not allowed to express that. And so I grew up not being good at expressing anger at all. It was until my PhD I started doing counseling. And Lane will tell you, now that I've said this, you'd be happy, she'll say, oh yeah, I was scared for a while because David, I didn't say it inside of him before. And I wasn't punching holes in the, the wall. No, I did break one thing. Yeah, I remember that now. It's one of my couches, which we still own. I was so mad at the cat. I think Ariel was little. And back when the little, the claws all over. And she jumped up. And she just like Cinderella would do something. But she jumped up. I think if I remember now, it was on my laptop. I was working. And she jumped to the side. And she clawed my arm like it was a couch. <coughs> and it was hanging there for like dear life. And it, it scared me. And boy, I got mad. So I picked her up and threw it. No, I'm just kidding. No, I, I did get off me very, very quickly. But man, I was, it hurt so much. I was like, oh, I hit the kind of, whoosh. whoops. But you can't see it. Lane Lemon, she goes, something's wrong with the chair. Something on the couch. It's not. I wonder what happened. It's weird. Ariel was jumping over there. I wonder if, uh... no, I told her what happened. She goes, and she goes that's, that's, you were really mad. I said, I was very, very, very mad. But that's the last time I've ever done it. But boy, I was mad. Woo. Uh, anyway, that was my. I'm just being confessional. That's my. This that was the most. That was. I have still to this day. I think I'm much much more better at expressing that. But Elaine had to adjust, as we would say in the South, bless her heart. She really had to adjust because I was almost never ever angry ever. And to this day, in my life, and I can't fathom doing this. I have never blown up at a person. Never. I've raised my boys. I've been mad. But people are like, I just let them have it. I've never done it in my life that I know of. I was certainly, certainly never done it to a stranger. Not a billion years. I can't fathom that. And so my struggle has been the opposite, which is being able to stand up for myself and have a view. Please don't talk to me that way. Please don't, whatever it is, that's, that's a big problem. Man. And because of that also, that's a different issue. But I, we have, don't have time for all my issues, sisters and brothers. All right, so that's one of my struggles. That's been my biggest one is being able to say, I don't like that. I mean, I'm mad about that. There we go. So despair, speaking of despair, this is one of the last things before except we can become unable to contain. Oh, any question on Facebook comments? Do you see anything? Nothing. Sorry, nothing? Okay. They're very mad at me and they're not talking. <laughs> we can become unable to contain our powerful emotions of sadness and pain. Unable to contain them. And our personality can change severely. And severely. And we can be overwhelmed with anguish, finding it difficult to control sobbing or weeping. That's the despair stage. That's the despair stage. We can feel compelled to retreat from normal life, routines, and relationships. So you, you escape. That's called escaping. That's very common in despair. We can form generalized, catastrophic beliefs. That's very common. Whenever Trump... Oh, I need to talk, oh, I need to talk about that. I've got to talk about it. So we might not... Okay, I'm going to come back to that. We can form generalized, catastrophic beliefs. For example, it'll never get better. No one can be trusted. It's best never to love again. All men are dogs. Women are no good. I'm not good at anything. I'm a loser. These are generalized catastrophic beliefs. We call irrational beliefs. Uh, there's a bunch of other irrational beliefs, tons of them. If this stage isn't processed efficiently, it can lead to severe depression, mental illness, detachment from others, and even suicide. This is the bottom of the barrel part of grieving. If this is the part where that gentleman next door who said, I had one year of the fog, came out of the fog, 
one year of despair, one year of deep, 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 the severe sadness. So despair could be that. Now, that depends on the level of the pain, but does that make sense? Any questions or comments about that? Was that man a believer? Was that man a believer? Yes. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were Christians. I, mean, I don't know for sure, but I think they were. I think they were. I mean, they said they were. They went to church all the time. It seemed to be that, you know, they took their faith seriously. Yeah, they were believers. Yeah. He. Um, but again, he. He. Um, he processed a lot more. Um, at 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 that time, right now, I don't know. At the time, he had processed the pain a lot more than she had. But they were they were all Christians. At least I would assume they were. I, I sure thought they were. Whenever an event happens, event E, whenever, oh, I'll just do it. Whenever an event happens, this changed my life. I learned this years ago. I, I'm just, I try to set people free with all this stuff. Whenever an event happens, we develop, we write, we compose a accompanying belief about, or beliefs, at least one belief about that event, a tra traumatic event, a trauma event, or sometimes non-traumatic events. So it's not that every single event there's a belief. The beliefs come when we, there's some event, we, we interpret it. So I uh, mean, this way maybe, we have an interpretation. Interpretation. At the marriage retreat, I want a workshop, I want to talk more about this as well. We develop, so we interpret that event. We look as it were, look backward on it. And, and then what do I think about that? We do it whether we're conscious of it or not. Beliefs are held chiefly by which ego state? The child. The child believes certain things. So the child is going through events, developing beliefs, and then doing this over and over and over and over. Now, that event might be a mom or dad telling them that you're a loser, you should never have been born, whatever. And they develop the belief, that's what happens. These beliefs that we develop can be true. They sure can be true. Um, people can be good to me. The world can be safe and unsafe, or it can be false beliefs. The false beliefs are the ones that cause the most damage, of course. They cause the damage in life. They're the ones that, and usually the false beliefs cause damage. They're always irrational, they're generalized or catastrophic. They are, they are disproportionate to what happened. And what most people do is have these beliefs put in them and or just figure them out themselves and they never get changed for the rest of their entire lives. So people who think all black people are going to hurt you because when I was a kid, a black person robbed me. All women can't be trusted because my mom had an affair with my dad. All people, whatever it might be, racism, racist claims, on and on it goes. These things develop, these beliefs either someone put them into you, something that event was you were told it, or the event you went through a trauma. So-and-so walked out on me, therefore I'll never do that. I mean, I bet people say, now that I'm a lesbian, why? Well, my, husband, my first husband was horrible, he beat me. Because I'll never go back. That's like in a form of denial. They develop the belief that men can't be trusted, and therefore. So that's what's so important, this despair part, is because so many false beliefs come from the despair. And I bet part of your homework could be very easily, if this is a very common therapy homework is, what we call cognitive behavioral therapy. The cognitive part is we look at, we try to list the beliefs we have. Now I can spend more time if you want, not tonight maybe, but um, if sometimes you want to, because beliefs are like, an, like the iceberg, the proverbial iceberg where, so this, we'll say this ocean, the black line, that's your conscious state, what you're thinking of right now. But the iceberg, of course, as it were, is a big thing. And then you're, you know, we're here. <laughs> That's what most people on a conscious level, conscious. conscious. I didn't spell it right, did it? Yeah, yeah. Anyway. And, but our beliefs are down here, down below. And because of that, we oftentimes don't know what beliefs we have. But they are there. There's a whole bunch of them. Whether they be true or false, they're all mixed in together. And beliefs drive your feelings, not your thoughts. Your beliefs do. And so this is why people always get this wrong. If you say something like, and this happens in counseling all the time, I cannot tell you how this is, everyone, almost everyone does this. I hear you talking about your story. I'm so sorry to hear your sad story. Da, 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 and I'll do a validation affirming. And I, how much have you grieved? I don't grieve. I don't talk. I'm time for that. 
Well, I really want to encourage you to know that grieving is okay. I know, I know, I know. I believe you. I believe that you know it's good, but you don't believe that. That's because you know it's true on your conscious level because it sounds right. If I'm an adult pretending to be my adult ego state, I know it. I know, I know, I know. I know God loves me. I know he loves me. I know I should find my value in him. I go for absolutely, yep, all, all day long. Then why don't you do that? Well, I don't know. I just don't know. I do know. You don't believe it. Because beliefs are down here. Do you have a belief down here that says I'm worthless? I'm not lovable. I'm not valuable. No one would ever love me. And who's in the no one category? God himself. No, no, I would never think that. Right. Okay, but you believe it. And so part of the profound part of counseling part, even if you counsel yourself, is getting these beliefs to the conscious level. And journaling is very powerful here. What do I believe about these things? What do I believe about life? What do I believe about God? Really, though, what do you believe about church? What do you believe about other people? Can people be trusted? Are they going to hurt you? What do you believe about the opposite sex or the same sex? What do you believe about Jesus? That can be difficult. Sometimes it takes a therapist to ask the right questions, but a lot of times you ask, well, what do I believe about that? It takes courage because everyone, they start feeling the shame starts coming up if they have toxic shame as a wounded child. I, I can't admit that I believe. No, 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 I would never think that. But you do believe it, right? You need someone in our just go, just the first step is acknowledging I believe it. I'm not saying I like that I believe it. Yeah, come to think of it, my dad was a racist. He said the N-word all the time, and that's exactly why I think that. I guess I do believe they can't be trusted. But that sounds horrible when I say it. Okay, that's how we start changing the belief. But first is acknowledging it's in you. Someone put it there. You were a child. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault at all. Just put inside your database. Do, 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 do. And there you go. Or it could be positive. Of course I could do well. I, I always believed I could do well. My parents said you can do anything you want to put your mind to. I believe that I'm a hard worker. Good for you. Where'd you go? My parents always said it. Good for them. Do you want to take that belief out or keep it in there? I want to keep that. Is that okay? Yeah, it sounds good to me. That sounds healthy. Good. Next, what's another one? We've got a whole list of these things. They're true and false. So the key is to figure out which ones they are, what your beliefs are, and then do you want to keep those in you or not? And despair, my point now is despair can give us all kinds of false beliefs because the pain hurts so much. We'll start believing all kinds of nonsense. It's so important to have good therapists or friends or counselors to say, hold on, please, 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 please don't believe that right now. I'll never make it out of this. It'll never get better. That's false. That's false. That's demonstrably false. I'll never be the same. Well, that's true, but you doesn't mean the same doesn't mean you'll always be worse. You understand that? So this all or nothing, we check ourselves. So you got enough homework for your, as you wrap up, enough homework for you on this, uh, what anger issues and despair issues and give yourself permission to feel things. And I'll come back next time. We'll jump right on there. And instead of despair, how do we do with that? And then we'll wrap it up. Any questions or comments about that? Anything at all? Let me throw this one at you. Uh oh. Uh -oh. In the, despair part so lost my brother older brother when i was 12 to an accident mm. and we were you know he was like my protector because of the the crazy childhood thing then my dad and i kind of reconciled like seven years later i was 19 he was 54 he got killed in a car wreck mm. two years later my two best friends were killed hit by a train and killed Five years later, her, her dad committed suicide. So every man I ever got close to died. So to this day, and I, Lord knows I grieved for all of these people, you know, a lot. But to this day, I still can't allow myself to get close. I mean, not intimately close with another man, like I did with those guys. I won't, you know, I get so close and then it's like, oh, sorry. I won't allow myself to do that. You know, it's like something, you know, like a yeah. red flag goes up. Yes. Like, nope, I'm not, I can't go there. That's your shield. That's yeah. your wounded child's attempt to protect yeah. himself. That pain stinks so much, yeah. I'll never experience yeah. that again. It's just too much, too many, you know, too many, too close, too, too soon. Yes. You know? Yes. So, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. It, just, it's, it makes sense that yeah. you would develop that false belief that I'll lose whomever I'm close to. That is a false belief, yeah, but it, it makes is. sense you developed it. But that radar goes up soon. Yeah. You, you know. yeah. The wounded child's getting scared. No, 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 no. And that triggers all the pain I felt before. I'm going to do this again. Yeah. And you, know, you end up pushing people away. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very common mechanism. I've, and I've known many people who start to get a little close and they, 
they just they just get more and more away. And I'm, they're just afraid, whatever they've been wounded or whatever it might be. I met a woman one time at church, and she said, and it was really, the story's not about me, but it's more about the trauma, but she had one time said, she was older lady, probably older than I was, I think, a little bit older, maybe about the same age. And she said, I've never trusted a pastor because I was molested by one. She goes, you're the first person I've ever opened up to. And I said, praise God, I'm so thankful, I appreciate that. And we met once or twice, that was it. She stopped going to classes, never never saw her really ever again, ever. And um, my gut immediately, I thought, probably because she opened up about that. And then it's a way of saying, I can't go back there again because now I'm going to represent her pain. Yeah. And that's sad. But I respect that and understand yeah. that, but that's sad. So I, I get it. I get it. It's, it's very common. It's a false belief, too. That you don't have to believe, you can if you want the rest of your life to do that. And I, if I have the, I can tell you my stories, man. I've been betrayed so many times by people I love. So many times in my childhood, I, it's very difficult for me to trust anyone. It's very difficult because I've been hurt so many times. That's a false belief. People are going to hurt me. They're going to hurt me. If I get close, they're going to hurt me. I fight that all the time. No, that's not true. Sometimes I accept it. I want to fight it. On my good days, I fight it. I like this. No, David, it's okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I get it. That's a false belief, though. And I know it's because I've been through events and trauma, and my belief was the pain that when the child's like, no, I can't go there again. To which as I've healed more and more, I go, yes, we can. I'm here with you. We can process disappointment again. And not everyone will believe us, and not everyone will be betray you. And what if it happens again? Then we'll deal with that. But I don't want to go through that again. That's what the child's saying. Yeah, it's real. It's real. God can save us from all that, that's for sure. So thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for expressing. I'm sorry, that's a lot of loss. Anything else? Can we pray for us? Anything else? I'll say pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being the kind of God that allows us to be grieving, to be sad. Thank you so much for developing the mechanism to allow us to be sad, through crying, talking about our feelings. And we're so thankful that you can bring people our lives that provide the nutrients that, sh- that we need, that we need to make it. I'm also so that we are so thankful. I guess I can speak on behalf of all of us. We're so thankful that you give us the capacity to heal from these grief, these wounds, even if it's been years and years and years since we've experienced the event. We ask for your help to do that. We ask for your help to be more mindful of what we feel, how we feel, put words to those things, to put words to the trauma, the fear, the sadness, the anger, the rage, whatever it might be, the despair, and know that in you we have validation. You love us so as a gentle, loving, safe God that we're safe to be whatever we are in that emotional state, that it's okay not to be okay. You don't cut us off. You don't get mad at us for, the, for having feelings. You design them. And that's a good, hopeful feeling. Because we know when other people fail us, whether they fail us because they died on accident, or they fail us on purpose, they betray us. Wherever they fail us, there's a loss. We're glad, God, that you do not fail us ever. Thank you for being that rock upon which we can stand. We ask Holy Spirit for your comfort when we are sad. Please help us go to you for that comfort. Help us get past the anger and feel it, but get past it so that we can start receiving your, your comfort through our pain. And Lord, God, of course, please help us comfort other people that we're going through that. Help us be a safe place for other people not to be okay, not to force them to look on the right side and force them to this or that, but instead be with them in their pain and help them heal through that. And maybe they can help us do that. Help us be open to that for other people to reach into our hearts and minds and build into us. We need your help for all that, God. We sure do. We thank you again so much for the opportunity to meet this morning, uh, tonight, and for belly of these, these sisters and brothers of Christ. Ask as we go here tonight, Holy Spirit, please give us your wisdom to be your ambassadors of Christ to every conversation we have. Everyone, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.